Hello, welcome to the third part of this week's process control lectures. This time we're going to focus on interacting systems and what the impact of that is. We talked about the two tanks before and the two tanks uh, in the first case were non-interacting because one was raised above the other so the height of the second tank didn't affect the what was happening in the first tank. But now if we put them next to each other on the same level then the height of the liquid in here will be affecting the height of the liquid here and there could be a flow backwards for example into the first tank. So how do we <coughs> how do we cope with that? Of course we've got their individual transfer functions but no longer is it the case that the overall transfer function is the product of the two individual transfer functions. So it's not as simple as it was before. What we can say is that it's always slower than the non-interacting case. The response um, of the interacting is always more sluggish and slower. And uh, we'll have a little look at why. So what do you do? Well, since we can't simply multiply the two transfer functions together, what we have to do is start from the first principles and work out the equations governing the process. So we're doing that here. We've got an equation that gives the rate of change of volume, so that's the area times the change in height of the first tank, and that will be equal to the difference in the flows. F flow, F1 is the flow in, F2 is the flow out. Likewise for the second tank, the rate of change of volume of the tank is equal to the difference of the flow F2 in and the flow F out. So that's a mass balance for each tank. Uh, and then we have an equation that defines the flow. We have the flow F2 is equal to a driving force, that's a change in height between H1 and H2, divided by some resistance, and the flow out of tank 2 is equal to the driving force H2, divided by the resistance R2. So we've got four equations there, and we can do some elimination. What we want to find out are H1 and H2, and our input to the process is F1. So F2 and F can be eliminated by appropriate substitutions, uh, and that will result in these two equations that govern the process. So we have two first order linear differential, ordinary differential equations, H1, H1, H2 here, and H2, H1, H2 here. So all linear terms, in H1 and H2 and uh, first order differentials but obviously the two equations are coupled together H1 and H2 appear in both of them F1 is something we know that's the input to the process so that's something that we would uh, determine ourselves but they're coupled together so essentially this is solving simultaneous equations we have two equations and two unknowns, H1 and H2, that we need to solve. Now we can do that, of course, we could use a matrix form, uh, we can do it by substitution, and if you look in the course textbook, you'll find that worked through, and you can see this. For the purposes of right now, we can just look at what happens generally. What we will find is that the poles of the transfer function are real and distinct, and that the response, therefore, of the interacting capacities is always overdamped. Due to the interaction between the two capacities in both ways, interacting capacities are always more sluggish than non-interacting. So we saw for non-interacting that it was always either overdamped or critically damped, uh, and now it is always overdamped. So the effect of having the interaction it just exacerbates the slowness in the response. It makes it even more sluggish to respond to an input. So comparing this as we increase the order of the system, if we say we have first order inputs, uh, sorry, first order processes one, two, and three as our sub-processes, when they are then brought together in a sequence, we've seen that the non-interacting case uh, always ends up being at least as slow as the slowest process, as the slowest sub-process. Uh, 
and then having it as an in non-interacting apologies uh, non-interacting is uh, at least as slow as the slowest one and then when they're interacting they're even slower still so I've avoided the detail here you can see the detail in the course textbook if you want to take a look to check these conclusions for yourself but um, you can imagine that the equations can become increasingly complicated as you work it out analytically um, and you'll be doing some practice of that in the example problems but essentially what this brings us to is a simplification that can make life a lot simpler when we recognize well lots of first order subprocesses end up always end up looking something like this so it never gets too complicated in terms of what the ultimate response is it just uh, sort of gets more sluggish and uh, a bit flat at the beginning here so we can go a long way by making some simplification now we remember from the first lectures about Laplace transforms we had a delay function so if that was our original signal if we have a delay in the response where nothing happens we can represent that as Laplace transform multiplied by e to the minus tds so td is the delay um, and uh, that's simply accommodated within the Laplace transform method by uh, multiplication of this factor that accounts for the delay so that's an easy thing that we can do we'll also find that if you have a series of delays one for each subprocess delay one delay two delay three when those get combined together in uh, some sort of combined process the overall delay is the sum of each of these subprocess delays so not only does it get uh, flatter at the beginning of the response the overall delay is the sum of those initial ones so then we can take typical case of a process response and we see well pretty flat to begin with and then it goes up and, and from that point it looks pretty first order so whilst this might be the combination of quite a few different sub processes we can see that there's the opportunity to simplify this into an approximate model <clears throat> now difficult to calculate analytically and if you have calculated it analytically maybe there's no benefit in simplifying it since you've already worked it out in detail however often you will be able to find this response experimentally and so it's not a case of having to solve the equations it's a case of studying a process and actually seeing how it responds and if you can get the experimental data then this is a way of approximating how the overall transfer function will behave a simple approximation is to treat an initial delay period TD with then followed by a first order process so how do you find what that initial delay is well you can see here you can take the gradient essentially from the point of inflection and extrapolate that down and then take that as the delay once you've got that you've got TD we still need a tau and a k term to give our approximate model well k is still given by the steady state output that is approached so as that curve flattens off you can take that value for k and then finally you can find the point where you get 63 percent of the way towards k and the difference between your time here and your time here will give you the time constant for the process so here's a simple way of coming up with an approximate solution for a combined uh, for process that is the combination of a number of subprocesses. So obviously there's a lot more detail that you could go into with those. See some of that in the course textbook and you'll see some of that in the examples. The next thing we're going to do is to take an example ourselves considering the development of a dynamic model. So that will be the fourth part of this week's lectures next. Thank you very much.